and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara. And we've been reading John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. We are currently on chapter 22. Get this. Tom moved closer. He smelled frying bacon and baking bread. From the east, the light grew swiftly. Tom came near to the stove and stretched out his hands to it. The girl looked at him, nodded so that her two braids jerked. Good morning, she said, and she turned the bacon in the pan. The tent flap jerked up, and a young man came out, and an older man followed him. They were dressed in new blue dungarees and a dungaree coat, stiff with filler, the brass button shining. They were sharpened, sharp-faced men, and they looked much alike. The younger man had a dark stubble beard, and the older man a white stubble beard. Their heads and faces were wet. Their hairs dripped water, stood in drops on their stiff beards. Their cheeks shone with dampness. Together they stood looking quietly into the lightning east. They yawned together and watched the light on the hill in that room, and then they turned and saw Tom. Morning, the older man said, and his face was either friendly nor unfriendly. Morning, said Tom, and morning, said the younger man. The water slowly dried on their faces. They came to the stove and warmed their hands at it. The girl kept to her work. Once she set the baby down and tied her braids together and back with a string, and the two braids jerked and swung as she worked. She set tin cups on a big packing box, set tin plates and knives and forks out. Then she scooped bacon from the d deep grease and laid it in a tin platter. And the bacon crickled, cricked and rustled as it grew crisp. She opened the rusty oven door and took out a square pan full of Big high biscuits. And the smell of the biscuits struck the air. Both of the men inhaled deeply. The younger said, Key rice, softly. Now the older man said to Tom, Had you breakfast? Well, no, I ain't, but my folks is over there. They ain't up. Need to sleep. Well, sit down with us then. We got plenty, thank God. Why, thank you, Tom said. Smells so darn good I couldn't say no. Don't she, the younger man asked. Ever smell anything so good in your life? They marched to the packing box and squatted around it. Working around here, the young man asked. Aim do, said Tom. We just got in last night, ain't had no chance to look around. We had twelve days' work, the young man said. The girl worked by the stove, said. They even got new clothes. Both men looked down at their stiff blue clothes, and they smiled a little shyly. The girl set out the platter of bacon and the brown high biscuits, and a bowl of bacon gravy and a pot of coffee, and then she squatted down by the box, too. The baby still nursed, its head up under the girl's shirt waist. They filled their plates, poured bacon gravy over the biscuits, and sugared their coffee. The older man filled his mouth full, and he chewed and chewed and gulped and swallowed. God Almighty, it's good, he said, when he filled his mouth again. The younger man said, we've been eating good for twelve days now, never missed a meal in twelve days, none of us. Working and getting our pay and eating. He fell to again, almost frantically, and refilled his plate. They drank the scalding coffee and threw the grounds to the earth and filled their cups again. There was color in the light now, a reddish gleam. The father and son stopped eating. They were facing to the east, and their faces were lighted by the dawn. The image of the mountain and the light coming over it was re were reflected in their eyes. And then they threw the grounds from their cups to the earth, and they stood up together. Got to get going, the older man said. The younger man turned to Tom. Looky, he said, we are laying some pipe. If you want to talk, walk over with us, maybe we could get you on. Tom said, well, that's mighty nice of you, and I sure thank you for the breakfast. Glad to have you, the older man said. We'll try to get you working if you want. You're goddamn right I want, Tom said. Just wait a minute. I'll tell my folks. He hurried to the Joe tent and bent over and looked inside. In the gloom under the tarpaulin, he saw the lumps of sleeping figures, but a little movement started among them. The bedclothes. Ruthie came wriggling out like a snake, her hair down her eyes and her dress wrinkled and twisted. She crawled carefully out and stood up. Her gray eyes were clear and calm from sleep, and mischief was not in them. Tom moved off from the tent and beckoned her to follow him. And when he turned, she looked at him. Lord God, you are growing up, he said. She looked away in sudden embarrassment. Listen here, Tom said. Don't you wake nobody up. But when they get up, you tell them I got a chance at a job, and I'm gonna going for it. Tomorrow I ate breakfast with some neighbors. You hear that? 
Ruthie nodded and turned her head away, and her eyes were a little girl's eyes. Don't you wake him up, Tom cautioned. He hurried up back to his new friends, and Ruthie cautiously approached the sanitary unit <coughs> and peeked in the open door doorway. The two men were waiting when Tom came back. The young woman had dragged a mattress out and put the baby on it while she cleaned up the dishes. Tom said, I wanted to tell my folks where I, where at I was. They wasn't awake. The three walked down the street between the tents. The camp had begun to come to life. At the new fires, the woman worked, slicing meat and eating the dough for the morning's bread, and the men were stir, stirring about the tents and about the automobiles. The sky was rosy now. In front of the office, a lean old man raked the ground carefully. He, he so dragged his rake that the time marks were straight and deep. You are out early, Pa, the young man said as they went by. Yep, yep, got to make up my rent. Rent, hell, the young man said. He was drunk last Saturday night. Sung in his tent all night. Committee give him work for it. They walked all along the edge of the oiled road. A row of walnut trees grew beside the way. The sun shoved its edge over the mountains. Tom said, seems funny. I've got your fruit, and I ain't told you my name. No, you ain't mentioned yours. I'm Tom Jode. The old man looked at him, and then he smiled a little. You ain't been out here long. Hell no, just a couple of days. I note it. Funny. You get out of the habit of men mentioning your name. They so goddamn many. Just fellas. Well, sir, I'm Timothy Wallace, and this here's my boy, Wilkie. Proud to know you, Tom said. You been out here long? Ten months, Wilkie said. Got here right on the tail of the floods last year. Jesus, we had a time. A time. Goddamn near starved to death. Their feet rattled on the oiled road. A truckload of men went by, and each man was sunk into himself. Each man braced himself in the truck bed and scowled down. Going out for the gas company, Timothy said. They got a nice job of it. I could have took our truck, Tom suggested. No, Timothy leaned down and picked up a green walnut. He tested it with his thumb and then shed it, shielded it at a blackboard bird uh, sitting on a fence wire. The bird flew up, let the nut sail under it, and then settled back on the wire and smoothed its shining feathers with its beak. Tom asked, ain't you got no car? Both Wallaces were silent, and Tom, looking at their faces, saw they were ashamed. Well, he said, place we work at is only a mile up the road. Timothy said angrily, no, we ain't got no car. We sold our car. Had to. Run out of food. Run out of everything. Couldn't get no job. Fellas come around every week buying cars. Come around, and if you're hungry, why, they'll buy your car. And if you're hungry enough, they don't have to pay nothing for it. And he was hungry enough. Give us ten dollars for it. He spat into the road. Wilkie said quietly, I was in Bakersfield last week. I seen her sitting in a used car lot, sitting right there, and seventy-five dollars with a sign on her. We had to, Timothy said. It was either us let them steal our car or steal something from them. We ain't had to steal yet, but God damn it, we've been close. Tom said, you know, before we left home, we heard there was plenty of work out here. Seen handbills asking folks to come out. Yeah, Timothy said, we seen them too, and they ain't much work. And wages is coming down all the time. I get so goddamn tired just figuring how to eat. You got work now, Tom suggested. Yeah, but it ain't going to last long. Working for a nice fella, got a little place, works alongside of us, but hell, it ain't going to last no time. Tom said, why in hell are you going to get me on? I'll make it shorter. What you got in your own throat for? Timothy shook his head slowly. I don't know. Got no sense, I guess. We figured to get us each a hat. Can't do it, I guess. There's the place off to the right there. Nice job, too. Getting 30 cents an hour. Nice, friendly fellow to work for. They turned off the highway and walked down a graveled road through a small kitchen orchard, and behind the trees they came to a small white farmhouse, a few shade trees, and a barn behind the barn. A vineyard and a field of cotton. As the three men walked past the house, the screen door banged, and the stocky, sunburned fellow man came down the back steps. He wore a paper sun helmet, and he rolled up his sleeves. As he came across the yard, his heavily sunburned eyebrows were drawn down in a scowl. His cheeks were sunburned, a beef red. Morning, Mr. Thomas, Timothy said. Morning, the man spoke irritably. Timothy said, This here's Tom Jode. We wondered if you could see a way to put him on. Thomas scowled at Tom. And then he laughed shortly, and his brow still scowled. Oh, sure, I'll put him on. I'll put everybody on. Maybe I'll get a hundred men on. We just thought, Timothy began apologetically, 
Thomas interrupted. Yes, I've been thinking too. He swung around and faced them. I've got some things to tell you. I've been paying you 30 cents an hour. That's right. Why, sure, Mr. Thomas, but, and I've been getting 30 cents worth of work. His heavy, hard hands clasped each other. We try to give a good day of work. Well, God, God damn it, this morning you're getting 25 cents an hour. You take it or leave it. The redness of his face deepened with anger. Timothy said, we give you good work. You said so yourself. I know it, but it seems like I ain't hiring my own men anymore, he swallowed. Look, he said, I got 35 acres here. Did you ever hear of the Farmers Association? Why, sure. Well, I belong to it. We had a meeting last night. Now, do you know who runs the Farmers Association? I'll tell you, the Bank of the West. That bank owns most of th this valley, and it's got paper on everything it don't own. So last night, the member from the bank told me, he said, you're paying 30 cents an hour. You'd better cut it down to 25. I said, I've got good men. They're worth 30. And he says, it isn't that, he says. The wage is 25 cents now. If you pay 30, it will only cost cause unrest. And but by the way, he says, you're going to need the usual amount for a crop loan next year. Tom st Thomas stopped. His breath was panting through his lips. You see, the rate is 25 cents and like it. We done good work, Timothy, Timothy said helplessly. Ain't you got it yet? Mr. Bank hires 2,000 men, and I hire three. I've got paper to meet. Now, if you can figure some way out, by Christ, I'll take it. They got me. Timothy shook his head. I don't know what to say. You wait here, Thomas. Walk quickly to the house. The door slammed after him. In a moment, he was back, and he carried a newspaper in his hand. Did you see this? Here, I'll read it. Citizens angered at red agitators. Burn squatters camp. Last night, a band of citizens infuriated the agitation going on in the local squatters camp. Burned the tents to the ground and warned agitators to get out of the county. Tom began, why I? And then he closed his mouth and was silent. Thomas folded the paper carefully and put it in his pocket. He had himself in control again. He said quietly, those men were sent out by the association. Now I'm giving them away. And if they ever find out, I told, I won't have a farm next year. I just don't know what to say, Timothy said. If they was agitators, I can't say, see why they was mad, Thomas said. I watched a long time. There's always red, red agitators just before pay cut. Always, God damn it, they got me trapped. Now what are you going to do, 25 cents? Timothy looked at the ground. I'll work, he said. Me too, said Wilkie. Tom said, seems like I walked into something. Sure, I'll work. I gotta work. Thomas pulled the bandana out of his hip pocket and wiped his mouth and chin. I don't know how long it can go on. I don't know how you men can feed a family on what you get now. We can while we work, Wilkie said. It's when, we, it's when we don't get work. Thomas looked at his watch. Well, let's go out and get dig some ditch. By God, he said, I'm going to tell you, you fellas live in that government camp, don't you? Timothy stiffened. Yes, sir. And you have a dances every Saturday night? <clears throat> Wilkie smiled. We sure do. Well, look out next Saturday night. Suddenly, Timothy straightened. He stepped close. What do you mean? I belong to the Central Committee. I got to know. Thomas looked apprehensive. Don't you ever tell I told. What is it? Timothy demanded. Well, the association don't like the government camps. Can't get a deputy in there. The people make their own laws, I hear. And you can't arrest a man without a warrant. Now, if there was a big fight and maybe shooting, a bunch of deputies could go in and clean out the camp. Timothy had changed. His shoulders were straight and his eyes cold. What do you mean? Don't you ever tell where you heard, Thomas said uneasily. There's going to be a fight in the camp Saturday night. There's going to be deputies ready to go in. Tom demanded, why, for God's sake? Those folks ain't bothering nobody. I'll tell you why, Thomas said. Those folks in the camp are getting used to being treated like humans. When they go back to the squatter's camps, they'll be hard to handle. He wiped his hand face again. Go on out to work now, Jesus. I hope I haven't talked myself out of my farm. But I like you people. Timothy stepped in front of him and put out a hand, lean hand. And Thomas took it. Nobody won't know who told. We thank you. There won't be no fight. Go on to work, Thomas said, and it's 24 cents an hour. We'll take it. Wilkie said, from you, from you. Thomas walked away toward the house. I'll be out in a piece, he said. You men get to work. The screen door slammed behind him. The three men walked out past the little white-washed barn and alongside a field edge. They came into long, narrow ditch with sections of concrete pipe lying beside it. Here's where we are working, Wilkie said. His father opened the barn and passed out two picks and three shovels, and he said to Tom, here's your beauty. Tom hefted the pick. Jumping Jesus, she... Don't feel good. Wait'll 
About 11 o'clock, Wolgie suggested. See how good she feels then. They walked to the end of the ditch. Tom took off his coat and dropped it on the dirt pile. He pushed up his cap and stepped into the ditch. Then he spat on his hands. The pick rose into the air and flashed down. Tom grunted softly. The pick rose and fell, and the grunt came at the moment it sank into the ground and loosened the soil. Let me get a little bit of drink here. Wilkie said, <coughs> Yes, sir. Pa, we got here a first grade muck stick man. This here boy been married to that there little digger. Tom said, I put in time. Oomph. Yes, sir. I sure did. Oomph. Put in my years. Oomph. <coughs> kind of like the feel. Oomph. The soil loosened about ahead of him. The sun cleared the fruit trees. Now, the grape leaves were golden green on the vines. Six feet along, and Tom stepped aside and wiped his forehead. Wilkie came behind him. The shovel rose and fell, and the dirt flew out to the pile beside the lengthening ditch. I heard about this here central committee, said Tom, so you're one of them. Yes, sir, Timothy replied, and it's a responsibility, all of them people. We are doing our best, and the people in the camp are doing their best. I wish them big farmers wouldn't plague us so. I wished they wouldn't. Tom climbed back into the ditch, and Wilkie stood aside. Tom said, how about this fight Oomph. at the dance? He told about Oomph. what they wanted to do that for. Timothy followed behind Wilkie, and Timothy shoveled behind the bevel the bottom of the ditch and smoothed it ready for the pipe. Seems like they got to drive us, Timothy said. They're scared to organize, I guess, and maybe they're right. This here camp is an organization. People, people there look out for themselves. Got the nicest string band in these parts. Got a little charge account in the store for folks that's hungry. Five dollars, you can get that much food in the camp will stand good. We ain't never had no trouble with the law. I guess the big farmers is scared of that. Can't throw us in jail. Why, it scares them. Figure maybe if we can govern ourselves, maybe we'll do other things. Tom stepped clear of the ditch and wiped the sweat out of his eyes. You hear what the paper said about agitators up north of Bakersfield? Sure, said Wilkie. They do that all the time. Well, I was there. They wasn't no agitators. What they call reds. What the hell is these reds anyways? Timothy scraped a little level in the bottom of the ditch. The sun made his white bristle beard shine. These a lot of fellows want to know what reds is. He left. One of our boys found out. He squatted the pile earth gently with his shovel. A fellow named Hines got about 30,000 acres, peaches and grapes. Got a cannery and a winery. Well, he's all the time talking about them goddamn reds. Goddamn reds is driving the country to ruin, he says. And we got to drive these here red bastards out. Well, they were a young fella just come out west here, and he's listening one day. He kind of scratched his head, and he says, What, Mr. Hines, I ain't been here long. What is these goddamn reds? Sort of reminds you of the Trump mindset type people who call everybody that doesn't agree with them communist. So if we're against them, then we got to be communists, which is not true. Well, sir, Hines said, a red is any son of a bitch that wants 30 cents an hour when we're paying 25. Well, this young fellow, he thinks about her, and he scratches his head, and he says, well, Jesus, Mr. Hines, I ain't a son of a bitch, but if that's what a red is, why, I want 30 cents an hour. Everybody does. Well, actually, reds, communists, are kind of, everybody knows that they're, they, everybody's on the same level, and nobody earns money, so it's, it's a lot different than what they're talking about. Well, Jesus, Miss Hines, I ain't a son of a bitch, but if that was what a red is, why well, I want 30 cents an hour. Everybody does. Hell, Miss Hines, we're all reds. Timothy drove his shovel along the ditch bottom, and the solid earth shone where the shovel cut is. Tom laughed. Me too, I guess. He pick, His picks arced up and drove down, and the earth cracked under it. The sweat rolled down his forehead and down the sides of his nose, and it glistened on his neck. Damn it, he said, a pick is a nice tool. Um, if you don't fight it, ump, um, you ain't, you and the pick, ump, um, working together, ump. Um. In line, three men worked, and the ditch inched along, and the sun shone hotly down on them in the growing morning. Well, when Tom left her, Ruthie gazed in at the door of the sanitary unit for a while. His, her courage was not strong without Winfield to boast for. She put her hair foot in on the concrete floor, and then withdrew it. Down the line, a woman came out of a tent and started a fire in a tin camp stove. Ruthie took a few steps in that direction, but she could not leave. 
She crept to the entrance of the Joe tent and looked in. On one side, lying on the ground, lay Uncle John, his mouth open and his snores bubbling spittily in his throat. Ma and Pa were convinced with the comfort their heads and away from the light. Al was in was on the far side from Uncle John, and his arm was flung over his eyes. Near the front of the tent, Rose of Sharon and Winfield lay, and there was the space where Ruthie had been beside Winfield. She squatted down and peered in. Her eyes remained on Winfield's toe head, and as she looked, the little boy opened his eyes and stared out at her, and his eyes were solemn. Ruthie put her finger to her lips and beckoned with her other hand. Winfield rolled his eyes over to Rose of Sharon. Her pink flushed face was near to him, and her mouth was open a little. Winfield carefully loosened the blankets and slipped out. He crept out of the tent cautiously and joined Ruthie. How long you been up, he whispered. She led him away with elaborate caution. When they were safe, she said, I never been to bed. I was up all night. You was not, Winfield said. You were a dirty liar. All right, she said, if I'm a liar, I ain't going to tell you nothing that happened. I ain't going to tell you how the fellow got killed with a stab knife and how there was a bear coming and took off a little child. There wasn't no bear, Winfield said uneasily. He brushed up his hair with his fingers and he pulled down his overalls at the crotch. All right, there wasn't no bear, she said sarcastically, and there ain't no white things made out of dish stuff like in the catalogs. Winfield regarded her gravely. He pointed to the sanitary unit. In there, she, he asked. I'm a dirty liar, Ruth, he said. It ain't gonna do me no good to tell you stuff to you. Let's go look, Winfield said. I already been, Ruth said. I already sat on him. I even peed in one. You never, neither, said Winfield. They went to the unit building. That time, Ruthie was not afraid. Boldly, she led the way into the building. The toilets lined one side of the large room, and each toilet had its compartment with a door in front of it. The porcelain was gleaming white. Hand basins lined another wall, while on the third wall were four shower compartments. There, said Ruthie, there, them's the toilets. I seen them in the catalogs. The children drew near to one of the toilets. Ruthie, in a burst of bravado, boosted her skirt and sat down. I told you I've been here. She said, and to prove it, there was a tinkle of water in the bowl. Winfield was embarrassed. His hand twisted the flashing, flushing lever. There was a roar of water. Ruthie leaped into the air and jumped away. She and Winfield stood in the middle of the room and looked at the toilet. The hiss of water continued it. You done it, Ruthie said. You went and broke it. I seen you. I never. Honest, I never. I seen you, Ruthie said. You just ain't to be trusted with no nice stuff. Winfield sunk his chin. He looked up at Ruthie and his eyes filled with tears. His chin quivered, and Ruthie was instantly contrite. Never you mind, she said. I won't tell on you. We'll pretend like sh she was already broke. We'll pretend we ain't never been in here. She led him out of the building. The sun lipped over the mountain by now, shone on the corrugated iron roofs of the five sanitary built units, shone on the gray tents, and on the swept ground of the street between the tents, and the camp was walking, waking up. The fires were burning in camp stoves. In the stoves made of kerosene cans and of sheets of metal, the smell of smoke was in the air. Tent flaps were thrown back and people moved about in the streets. In front of the Joe tent, Ma stood looking up and down the street. She saw the children and came over to them. I was worrying, Ma said. I didn't know where you was. We was just looking, Ruthie said. Well, where's Tom? You seen him? Ruthie became important. Yes, ma'am, Tom. He got me up and told me what to tell you. She paused to let her importance be apparent. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit notification. And stay tuned for the next part on John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, Chapter 22.